Well, we are, <clears throat> excuse me, continuing our series entitled Get in the Game. And we have talked about some principles that are necessary if you're going to get in the game. God doesn't have a JV team. You need to be in the game, period. God did not uh, send Christ to go to Calvary. The Father did not uh, uh, have it in his plan that Jesus would go to Calvary so that you could say some sinner's prayer and then not be engaged with what God is doing. Salvation means I'm engaged in what God is doing in this world. And so we talked about the need to have our trust in the right place, to uh, have our confidence not in who we are, but in whose we are. Uh, And we've talked about the need to take a chance. There's times when you need to take a chance. You see it in sports all the time. A coach will call a play and take a chance. One of the most memorable ones of those was in the Super Bowl several years ago. Sean Payton kicking off to the Indianapolis Colts, New Orleans Saints. And what's he do at halftime? He calls an onside kick, and the Saints recovered it, and they beat Eli Manning and the the Indianapolis Colts in that Super Bowl, and they had no business doing it. But Coach Payton took a chance. In the same way in the spiritual life, there are times when when we, like Esther, need to take a chance. Well, what I want to do now uh, in the series is is just uh, begin to shift our focus to, okay, so we've got these, these principles in play, and we've got these things that we know we need to have. Now, how do we put the boots on the ground in our day-to-day life. And so we're going to talk about uh, things like uh, uh, getting in the game uh, in our vocation, getting in the game uh, uh, financially, getting in the game in our relationships. How do we get in the game in in those ways between Sundays, 365 days a year and on leap years, 366 days? How do we do this? And so uh, today we're going to talk about your job and your work. Isn't this exciting? You thought this was the weekend and you're supposed to get away from that. Au contraire, my friends. Au contraire. I've entitled our message today, Do Your Job. Now, this is, uh, for those of you that are familiar with coaching, this is an axiom that many coaches will use. Do your job. Don't try to do your teammate's job. You do your job. If a coach is going to call a play, everybody has to do their job. That's what makes the play successful. Where we get into trouble is when we don't do our job and we get out of our lane and we get into their lane and then into their lane. Dude, stay in your lane, bro, right? Right, stay in your lane. Do your job. If you're the offensive lineman, you got to make your block. If you're the quarterback, you got to make the throw, right? Or you you got to take the snap. You got to hand it off. You got to do do your job. And that's what we're going to talk about uh, today. We are living in times when work is being, and the, where, where the value of work is being significantly undermined. Uh, American culture is, has shifted uh, to, um, you know, oh, shoot, you have to work. That's too bad. And nothing could be further from the heart of God for your life and mine. Work was a part of absolute perfection in the Garden of Eden when God created the earth. Work existed before sin. Did you know that? Here's how Paul said it in the New Testament. He said, hey, listen, you got some people there that don't want to work. I think the Thessalonian church. How about this? If you don't work, you don't eat. Aren't you glad that Paul's not your grandpa or your dad? Right? But there's value in that. And what, was, what did Paul understand? You've got people who are capable of working who refuse to work. And if they're going to refuse to work and they're capable of working, then don't let them eat. That ought to get their attention. Why? Because work is insanely and pervasively spiritual. And yet here's the, here's the struggle that so many of us have. We don't know how work connects to our job or how how a spiritual life connects to our work, to our job. And so we spend 90 to 95% of our life and our our working years just, you know, serving God on the weekend by sitting in for 60 minutes on a service. That's where God fits. And that's why there's such a there's so much missing in your heart and your soul, and you know it. You you just feel it. There's this emptiness. There's this uh, this void. This ah. And so in whatever you do, as a job, this is this is the the platform that consumes the majority of time in your life. 
You are to, from that platform, make God famous. So for the stay-at-home mom, which, by the way, uh, my perspective of stay-at-home moms is that it's probably the hardest job in America. It is one of the most undervalued uh, uh, jobs in America, and it becomes socially awkward for stay-at-home moms because not only are they paying uh, somewhat of a financial price, uh, but they are also uh, having to deal with the social awkwardness of people kind of looking down their nose at them. Oh, you don't work? And so, so stay-at-home moms have, have a whole lot to grapple with, not to mention kids. Now, listen, I love it when your four kids come to my house, but man, I love it when they go home. Because <laughs> here's what I know about kids. We, you know, our daughter was exhausting. We had one. And some of you got two or three or four or whatever. I love your kids, and I love to have them over to my house. But, but just know that I'm sleeping good. <laughs> when you're putting them to bed. I mean, it's awesome. Uh, and you'll get there too someday, we think, if Jesus doesn't return, uh, you know, before that. But that's, that's just kind of the nature of it. Kids are exhausting. So for the stay-at-home mom, that's her job. It's unpaid. So we're not just talking about paid vocations here. Her job, what consumes the majority of her time, that stay-at-home mom, she must get in the game in, the, in that context. Do it for the glory of God. For the retiree, now you've got a bunch of extra time on your hands. you got to get in the game in your retirement. There is no such mention of retiring from kingdom work or the kingdom of God in the scriptures. That is false, period. You don't retire from salvation. You don't retire from, from the work of God. If you're retired, God, what do you want me to do now? with this new platform of time that you have given me? How do you want me to invest it? For the student, you got to get in the game with your studies. Yeah, I know school's a drudgery. You know why? Because you don't have a proper view of school. School's your job. So stop giving your teachers guff. Stop thinking you're cool when you do because you're not. You do look as stupid as you think you do when you do that. I mean, it's true. We, you know, I've been there. Believe me, some of my stuff is on video. And don't you dare ask my mom for it. Don't you dare. Uh, no, go to school and in your studies, get in the game. Get in the game for the tradesman, you know, the plumber, the carpenter, the construction worker, uh, you know, whatever, the welder, whatever trade you're in. In the midst of the sweat and the heat of the day, you sweat to the glory of God because that is the primary platform for your spiritual life to manifest itself to the world in which you are living in those moments. This is a totally different way of thinking about work, isn't it? For the business owner, you got to get in the game by practicing God-honoring business ethics. And believe me, the current of culture does not push you in that direction. They push you to cut corners, to cheat people, to get that it's all about the bottom line, yada, yada, yada. No. That's not a proper view of work or your job. You got to do your job as God wants you to do it. And the list could go on and on and on. Tim Keller, a pastor in New York City, uh, and one of his uh, people in his congregation, Catherine Osdorf, wrote a book several years ago entitled Every Good Endeavor. It's a fantastic read talking about how we connect our Christian faith to our work. And here's what they say in the book. We are given specific work to do because we're made in God's image. We are called to stand in for God here in this world, exercising stewardship over the rest of creation in his place as his vice regents. And so what that means is, students, when you're in school, you should be showing the world what Jesus would look like if he were a student in that desk or in that chair. If you're a nurse, you should show the world what it would look like if Jesus were a nurse in the clinic or the hospital. If you're a teacher, same thing. If you're a farmer, what would it look like if God were on this earth today in the flesh and he were farming? How would this look? Well, nobody's watching. Does it matter? Yes, it matters. And we're, I'm so glad you brought that up because we're going to talk about that today. And yet, I'm going to say what everybody's feeling right now. There's this, this inner tension within us what is all of this work about? It seems so useless. It's not making a difference. What am I doing? It's, yeah. 
every week, those thoughts dominate my mind. They're just knocking at the door of my mind, and I'm in a constant battle to reject them. The wisest man who ever lived addressed that. In Ecclesiastes chapter 2, King Solomon said this, beginning with verse 18. Thus I hated all the fruit of my labor for which I had labored under the sun. For I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be a wise man or a fool. Yet he will have control over all the fruit of my labor for which I have labored by acting wisely under the sun. This too is vanity. Therefore, I completely despaired of all the fruit of my labor for which I had labored under the sun. And some of us came to the end of this last week feeling just like that. What am I doing? I have done a good job. I have worked hard. I've amassed this, this bank account. I've got these possessions. And I'm going to leave it to somebody else because God knows my time is ticking away and I am going to die. And then who gets everything that I worked for? And chances are that they're not going to be as wise with what I earned as I was. Have you ever felt that? This is why I love the Bible. The Bible, you will never experience or encounter anything in your life to which the Bible does not speak. And this is a great example of it. Because we're all wondering, why am I doing this? Are they ever go? How many of you ever felt like that as a parent? Why am I even parenting? This child is doomed. <sighs> well, hey, listen. Your parents did the same thing when you weren't watching. Okay? So that's why you did that. You know, it's genetic. So you got you to gotta understand that. But here's the bottom line. Here's the bottom line. Here's what we need to understand as we, as we begin to unpack this today. And this is in your notes. Work is not a necessary evil. It is a God-given opportunity. Work is not a necessary evil. It is a God-given opportunity. Some of you woke up this morning maybe fretting tomorrow because tomorrow's Monday and that's the first day of your week. And you're like, oh. So glad I got today and go to church. Listen, I'll probably sleep to part of what he says, but I can come home, watch football, and fall asleep, you know, later in the game and take a little nap because ah, oh, I gotta get up and go to work on Monday. Do you see what your view of work is? I can tell you, you see it as a necessary evil, and I want you to shift your mind and begin to see it as a God-given opportunity. If this is where you spend most of your time, don't you think that God has specifically given it to you for a time such as this? And it's time for you and me to take a chance and start to think about our work differently. It is not a necessary evil. It's a God-given opportunity. In the New Testament books of Colossians and Ephesians, Paul wrote both of these. The Apostle Paul wrote it to the church in Colossae and the church in Ephesus. What's interesting about these books is their structure is the same. Uh, the first half of of the book of Ephesians deals with theology, and the second half of the book of Ephesians deals with how to put that theology into practice. In the book of Colossians, you'll see the first half of the book dealing with theology, and then Paul tells the Colossians how to put the theology that he just taught them into practice in their day-to-day -day life. We're going to read these because he said, he, he talked about work to both churches, to the church in Ephesus and to the church in Colossae. He talked about their work, and it almost sounds identical. We're going to start in Colossians, and we'll go back to Ephesians. But let's look at Colossians 3, and we'll start at verse 22 and read through chapter 4 and verse 1, and then we'll go to Ephesians chapter 6. Here it is. Colossians 3, 22. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything you do. Try to please them all the time, not just when they're watching you. Uh-oh. Serve them sincerely because of your reverent fear for the Lord. Work willingly at whatever you do, as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward and that the master you are serving is Christ. But if you do what is wrong, you will be paid back for the wrong that you have done. For God has no favorites. Masters, be just and fair to your slaves. Remember that you also have a master in heaven. Then over to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with deep respect and fear. Serve them sincerely as you would serve Christ. Try to please them all the time, not just when they're watching you. As slaves of Christ, do the will of God with all your heart. 
work with enthusiasm as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will reward each one of us for the good we do, whether we are slaves or free. Masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Don't threaten them. Remember, you both have the same master in heaven, and he has no favorites. Slaves. He uses that term. We're not talking about, you know, American slaves back in the 1700s and 1800s. Different form of slavery um, for them in the first century world. Uh, slaves would, it fits what we experience today as employees, very, maybe a little more uh, binding uh, in those days. Uh, but nonetheless, slaves, just because we don't own slaves, doesn't mean this doesn't apply to us because most of us are, what Paul is talking about, he's talking to us as employees. And you masters, masters of slaves, that's, that's those of you who have people under you, whether you're a manager or a business owner or whatever. So this is all-encompassing, what Paul says. And he, he gives us four ways that our going to work is different than the world. So let's look at it. Number one, what's the difference? Number one, the first difference is the who. And that's my master. My master. It's all about the who, who we serve. The follower of Jesus does not go to work to please their boss. That's why you're graveled so often, because you're trying to please the wrong person. Now, yes, you're supposed to please them, but notice the order that Paul puts this in. You do not serve an earthly master. You don't serve an earthly employer. Your first responsibility is to serve God, and that's what makes you a model employee. Wow, yeah, that's different than the world. That's, that's different than the, the approach. Listen, listen, if, if Billy Bob Thornton, the great actor, was your boss, hey, dog, I didn't know you was back in town. There's your tombstone reference for you this morning. Hope you enjoyed it. Listen, if, if Billy Bob Thornton was your boss, I guarantee you he would say things to you and probably treat you in a very frustrating way because after all, he's one of the, uh, uh, you know, uh, elites uh, of, of the acting world and all that kind of stuff, you know, and he would treat you just like a dish rag, you know, throwing you around. And, yeah, give me this, give me that, give me this, give me that. You know what? If Billy Bob Thornton was your boss, you could gladly serve him because he's not your boss. God is. Billy Bob Thornton's name may be on your check, but he's not your provider. God is your provider. You see the difference that that makes? When you get that right, it changes everything. You got that teacher, kids, that you can't stand in school. You just want to put toothpicks in your eyes. You want to call in sick. <coughs> I got sick for an hour. I had to skip that class. Listen, stop going to class for that teacher. Go to class for Jesus. And that teacher thing is going to come into alignment. Because why do you think God has you in that class anyway? Is it just happenstance? Is it just, is it just random? Absolutely not. The who? The master, our master is not earthly. We serve our master in heaven. Secondly, the second difference for Christians at work is the why. It's my motivation. Why we do what we do. I saw yesterday, uh, it was on ESPN, I think it was on the app. Uh, it, it caught my eye because we were talking about this today. Uh, but they had a little quip from Greg Popovich, who is uh, the head coach of the San Antonio Spurs and is known... <laughs> <laughs> for his interactions with the media. Uh, and they asked him, what is your motivation every day to get up and go to work? And what do you think he said? He said what, what the vast majority of Americans would say. Just one word, that's all it takes, money. That's, that's what gets him going. How empty and futile is that? Because you know what? Someday he's going to retire. Someday there's not going to be a check coming in. You know, he, He's not going to have the the, the interactions with the media or his, his players or, or other coaches or whatever, someday he's going to be on a bed and he's going to be breathing his last breaths and all that money that motivated him to go to work. If something doesn't change in Greg Popovich's life, he's destined for hell. But if he'll get a hold of Jesus, it'll change everything. Because it's not just the, the, the who, it's the, the why. It's the motivation. Why do you go to work? Do you go to get a bigger paycheck? Do you go for a greater sense of satisfaction? Do you go to work so that the boss can watch you work and tell everybody else how awesome you are? Is that, is that why you go to work? Paul says this is not the way that it should be. The motivation for working as a child of God is different than the world. Our motivation does not come from the things that this world has to offer. 
You see, when we go to work, the follower of Jesus views his job, views his occupation, views his work as an opportunity, an open door that God has placed before him to draw closer to Jesus Christ himself. Have you ever thought of your job that way? Well, it's easy for you to say, Ken, because after all, you're a pastor and, and life is just on the clouds and your halo and all that that, that you have and, and your job is just so easy. Listen, friends, I have the same temptations that you have at your job. My job has its own frustrations. Your job has frustrations that mine doesn't have, vice versa, all that kind of stuff. From the vocational standpoint, but what's our motivation? Your motivation for going to work and my motivation should be the exact same. God, from this platform, do what you will through my life. And that's what Paul was telling the Colossians and the Ephesians. When you go to work, there's going to be people that you interact with, and guess what? That's not random. That's God. God is at work. What is he doing? Are your antennas attuned, or is God your weekend thing, your spiritual life your weekend thing, so that your motivation for going to work is the carrot that the boss puts out in front of you, or the accomplishment of a job well done, or whatever. Listen, our motivation comes from what Christ has done for us. We serve because he served us. In light of all that Christ has done for you, are you grateful? Are you appreciative? But Ken, you don't know where I work. What, what, what's, what's my motivation? Listen, I, I worked at KOA uh, Campground in Great Falls for a few years in my young adult years. Uh, my brain had left me, and I was just trying to find it again. And so I would go to the KOA campground and look for it. Uh, it's kind of that's that's how it felt when I reflect on those three or four years of my life. Like, oh, what's happening? Uh, my parents were patient with me, but I remember one year I got to work with a guy named Dempsey Harshaw. He was a retired uh, military guy. He was from the South, so he had an accent, which was cool. He was African-American, which was even more cool, uh, you know, and he drove a white Ford pickup truck with a topper on it. And one day, Les, our boss, called us to the office, and he said, uh, guys, uh, campsite number whatever has this big old camper in it, you know, those hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of campers, those ones back then, imagine how much they are now, I don't even want to know. It was one of those. Well, this person had taken their sewer line and they had put it into the PVC pipe that was the electrical. And they had come to Les and they had said, uh, our sewer is backing up. And so Dempsey and I get there and, and Dempsey said, well, yeah, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Kim, Kim give, me that, give me that glove. Oh, praise the Lord. Oh, Lord. Um, that's just how he was. <laughs> I mean, he was a joy to work with. And he just put that big old plastic glove on, and he stuck it down into there. And the whole time, he was praising God. And I was standing over here trying not to vomit. <laughs> yeah. Oh, praise the Lord, Jesus. Oh, who does this, Ken? Who does this? Who does it? Who does this, Ken? <laughs> and I'm like, uh. But you know what I learned from Dempsey in, in that little interaction that day? Was that he had a motivation that was way different than mine at that particular point in life. My motivation for being at KOA was to have money so I could go screw around, uh, honestly. Dempsey's motivation as a mature Christian man was serving other people because he was serving God. You see, that's what was different about me and Dempsey. It's not just the who, the master. It's not just the why, the motivation. You see, God is not a weekend motivation. He is the ultimate motivation. It's also number three. The how is different for Christians. When we go to work, this is about our attitude. My attitude is to be different. So think about your coworkers. Is your attitude the same as theirs? When they gossip and bicker and, and bark and talk about the boss behind his back, are you right there with them? Then you're no different than they are. And the question is, how come? Because after all, aren't you professing to be a follower of Jesus? You are supposed to be different. You are supposed to be different in your job and in your work. And so am I. This goes to our attitude, and Paul, in these two passages, both in Ephesians 6 and Colossians 3, there's several words that he uses here. He talks about doing things sincerely. He talks about doing them from the heart. He talks about doing them with enthusiasm, so, such words that are pregnant with, with meaning. That word sincerely, do your work sincerely. It means with a singleness of purpose, the singular purpose. You say, you, you, you might say to yourself, 
Nobody cares about what I do. God does. And that's what matters. We got to be okay without the praise of men. We got to get this right in our minds because this is what changes. This is what makes the difference in our work. And by the way, while the world may not know where you are, God knows right where you are. And when he needs you, he knows where to find you. You just keep being faithful to him because there's one thing that nobody can take away from you, and that is your attitude, how you do what you do. It's your choice. You can, I can gripe, I can, I, I can you know, complain, I, I can do that, or I can rejoice, I can be thankful, I can be helpful, I can stay after, I can punch out and then do more work after that. Why would you do that, Ken? Aha, aha, we've gotten to some motivation, haven't we? Because money's not my motivation, might be how, 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 that, how that works. So what if I got to stay 15 more minutes and, and, I, and I'm off the clock? You see, a Christian, a follower of Jesus will do that. The world, not always. What's bad is when the world is willing to do it, but God's people aren't. Your attitude for why you do what you do matters to God because there's what he says, notice what Paul said to both churches here in Colossae and in Ephesus. He said, don't just work hard when your boss is watching. What's he talking about? He's talking about your attitude. This is not about you. This is not about me. It is about him. It is about God And my attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but humbled himself and made himself obedient to the point of death on a cross. How's your attitude at work? How's your attitude towards work? I don't know how to change my attitude. I've been so nasty for so long. Friend, God knows how to change your attitude. God can change it. You got to offer it to him. And maybe instead of seeing it as your work, say, God, I'm going to give my work to you. It's a different attitude altogether, but it makes a difference. And it makes work more fulfilling. Listen, your work is, work is hard enough. It's difficult enough. It can be frustrating enough. It can be disappointing enough. Why not? try to position ourselves for the greatest amount of flourishing possible in the midst of a sinful world. And that's what Paul was talking about. It's the who, the why, the how, and then there's the what, which is my reward. And this has to do with timing. Is it, what reward are you working for? A good retirement? Is, is that what you want? A, a, great, a great retirement? There's nothing wrong with that. Do, do you want the attaboys from the boss because you do a good job? I hope you do a good job. I hope you get attaboys. I hope your boss is encouraging to you. I hope so. But those are all earthly rewards. And Paul pointed both churches to a different reward. He said, your work on this planet is connected to your eternity in heaven. Wow. Your work is spiritual. Spiritual work isn't for pastors. You do spiritual work because you are a child of God. And I am a child of God. So we do this work for a reward that is eternal. Listen to what the psalmist said in Psalm 39, verse 6. We are merely passing or merely moving shadows. And all our busy rushing ends in nothing. How many of you had a day this last week that felt just like that? Yes! Yes! But he says, we heap up wealth not knowing who will spend it. And how many of us would not agree that there are just days that feel like that? Here we are doing our thing, earning our money, and just, and what did I really do? You got to remember, your reward is not for now. Your reward will come in heaven. The reward not for living a good godly life, the reward for your, for your work, for your job, your occupation. This is countercultural, and it will transform your life. It will transform your household if you can get a hold of it. If I can get a hold of it, it will change me on a daily basis. 
Old Testament scholar Bruce Waltke. He's one of the leading Old Testament uh, uh, linguists, and uh, we, would, we would call him a Hebrew expert. Um, but he, he notes in his commentary on Proverbs, where there's two, ty- two groups of people that are talked about throughout the book of Proverbs, the righteous and the wicked. Here's what he says. The Bible says that the very definition of righteous people is that they disadvantage themselves to advantage others, while the wicked are willing to disadvantage the community to advantage themselves. And America right now wants to teach you and they want to push you in your work to disadvantage the community, disadvantage the workplace, disadvantage others to advantage yourself. But what did Jesus do? He was righteous. He disadvantaged himself to advantage you and me. Righteousness and wickedness. It's all about the eternal reward. Do you need to get in the game vocationally? I'll tell you, Paul's words are so simple, they're so clear, that I've had to, I've had to get before God this week and wrestle with some things because I feel like Solomon some days. And I know some of you do too. I know that. What am I doing? Why do I do that? I'm just going to I quit. God, I quit. I mean, that's just where we get sometimes emotionally. But the Word of God brings us back to the center. You want to see an outpouring of the Spirit of God? Stop waiting for a great church service and start going to work and do your job. It'll make a difference. It'll transform people because the Holy Spirit is ready to transform you. One writer said, all vocations are equal before God. And this echoes the words of Martin Luther in the 1500s. Pastors, monks, nuns, and popes are no holier than farmers. They're no holier than shopkeepers or dairy maids or latrine diggers. In the spiritual kingdom, peasants are equal to kings. Is that how you view your job? Because you should. It's scriptural. I didn't put this in your notes because I came across it late in the week. But I want to take you to Isaiah chapter 28. And I'm going to read verses 24 through 29. And listen to what God says here. Does a farmer always plow and never sow? Is he forever cultivating the soil and never planting? Does he not finally plant his seeds, black cumin, cumin, wheat, barley, and emmer wheat, each in its proper way and each in its proper place? The farmer knows just what to do. For God has given him understanding. A heavy sledge is never used to thresh black cumin. Rather, it is beaten with a light stick. A threshing wheel is never rolled on cumin. Instead, it's beaten lightly with a flail. Grain for bread is easily crushed. So he doesn't keep on pounding it. He threshes it under the wheels of a cart. But he doesn't pulverize it. The Lord of heaven's armies is a wonderful teacher and he gives the farmer great wisdom. And what is true for the farmer is true for you. It's true for the pastor. It's true for the postman. It's true for the hotel worker. It's true for the fast food employee. God will give you the wisdom to make his name great where you work. The farmer learns how to plant and what to plant and when to plant it so that it will grow. And he is fully dependent on God for the weather because we can't control that. And friend, you and I need to understand the heart of our God is not that we labor through life in our work. Yes, by the sweat of your brow, you will bring forth the produce. That is a curse on the ground, not on work. We got to understand that. That is a curse on the ground and not on work. Work for you and for me is deeply and intensely spiritual. And if we will go to work and work in God's way, it will make a difference in our life and it will make a difference in everybody's life that comes into contact with us. You want to be a light in darkness? Work 
like God instructs you to work. Do your job. Don't try to do my job. Don't try to do his job or her job or whatever. Do your job. It's powerful stuff. Go to work and make God famous. It's the platform he's given you. Let's not waste it. Will you stand with me today? Jesus, we come to you today and we are humbled by such simple words. We want to make a difference where we work. We want to be light in darkness. And God, there are some of us who are here today and we just need to ask your forgiveness because we have viewed work wrongly for far too long. We have not viewed it as a gift from you, as a God-given opportunity to be drawn to you, to refine our motivation and our attitudes, to serve other people, to ultimately serve you with gladness and with joy. God, we just missed it and we ask for your forgiveness of that. But God, in light of the truth, I pray that you would just make the changes in our hearts that need to be made. Lord, let your word not return void. But God, take the seed of your word today and plant it into the fallow ground of our hearts. And I pray, Lord, for every workplace that is represented by the jobs represented in this room. God, I pray for a, an increase of godly wisdom. I pray for an increase in people seeing Jesus in us. And I pray, God, that you would open the doors for us at work to talk to other people about the difference that you've made in our lives, to talk to other people about why we do our work the way that we do our work. May we honor you from the platform you've given us, which is our work, our occupation, what what dominates our time. Lord, we are so thankful that you speak into every area of life. And I would just ask that as we go from this place that you would encourage our hearts and that you would bring new life, not just to our individual spiritual lives, but to our homes, to our workplaces, and to this community, to this region, I pray. Lord, let our work be done in a God-honoring way. We give you all the thanks and the praise for it. In the precious and holy name, amen. Amen. Well, God bless you as you go today. Do your job and make God famous.